happy Friday morning. I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, and I hope that the presentation by Nicole was very valuable to you. As I told you, uh, I'm gonna let you watch this lecture at your leisure through the weekend. I do expect that you've watched this by Monday morning. Uh, Monday morning we'll do any review or uh, work with anything that you have questions on. So this lecture is on connective tissue. I love connective tissue. It's been a com my first research article I published was on connective tissue and connective tissue drives a lot of value. So the objective of this lecture is to help you to understand connective tissue structure. And in that structure, we'll talk about the role of ground substance and then the role of fiber, of connective tissue fibers, which the main ones we deal with in meat science are collagen, elastin, and reticulin fibers. And the last thing we're gonna do is try to understand how collagen solubility what it is and what its role is in meat tenderness. Well, we started out in ultrastructure talking about paramecium and endomecium, and I wanted to show you a picture of them. And this is also from your textbook. I think you've seen this before, but the black and white picture over here, you can see the little honeycomb. That's endomecium. That is the little woven, uh, uh, collagen fibers or connective tissue around the muscle fiber itself. And then you see the muscle bundles and that's paramecium. And paramecium is around individual bu bundles and contributes about 80% of connective tissue contribution to tenderness. So it's a ma very major part. This is an electron micrograph of meat and you can see the meat fibers here it's a cross section and this is paramecium right here all of this is paramecium this those little holes is adipose tissue i've shown you this picture before and that's marbling there's marbling and marbling is embedded in the paramecium and when you look at this paramecium, this is kind of like looking at the walls of the Grand Canyon. You can see that it, it, paramecium is put together in sheaths and uh, that it's wavy there. So uh, connective tissue is very fascinating because it's extracellular. And I call this my pink slide. I like this slide. It's not in your textbook. As you know, I, I pull these from different resources. And what's interesting about connective tissue is because it is extracellular, it surrounds muscle fibers, individual cells in different ways. Uh, we know it surrounds the muscle, the muscle bundles, and, we, and the muscle fibers, the epimecium, paramecium, and endomecium, and it's fibrous. Now in this picture here, I wanna kind of explain a couple of things. I always felt like this picture looked like uh, I was walking along because you know I, I love the mountains and I love the outdoors and I thought oh this looks like uh, the forest, uh, the, for the ground in the forest where trees have fallen and branches have fallen. The, the pink cylindrical things that you see, some of them look smaller because they're further back in the slide, those are collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are like big tree trunks that have fallen in the forest. And notice that there is some structure here, they're interwoven. And there's a line, there's a bunch of lines there. That isn't that the, uh, the glass was cracked, but those very thin lines are actually a different type of fiber that's called elastin. And elastin is smaller in diameter, that's why it's thinner, and it's very tough. The eye of round, or the hamstring muscle, is high in elastin because it has to push and move, and if you've ever torn or hurt your hamstring muscle, you get a really good idea of how much leverage and how much strength you, uh, there is there in that eye of round or semi-tendinosis is its official name uh, in movement. 
Now there's one kind of fiber I've, uh, that is not shown here and it's called reticulin. We're gonna talk about each fiber individually, but reticulin is not shown in this picture. Reticulin is also very small in diameter and it's very tough. And it is the first connective tissue that develops embryonically and mainly provides support for organs. Well, this is all in the extracellular space. There's, you think, where, where are the cells? Doesn't it have to have cells? And it does. These little dots here are nuclei and they're nuclei of the cell that's called a fibroblast. We talked about fibroblasts, especially when we're talking about adipose tissue development. Remember the mesenchymal cells? They can either differentiate into fibroblasts or preadipocytes. So here's where the fibroblasts are because we have to have something to produce collagen and elastin. Collagen and elastin are and reticulin are proteins, so we have to have a nuclei someplace. And we'll talk about those fibroblast cells. But the last thing I wanna point out in this slide is think about taking a very gooey gelatin and smushing it into this cell, into here, and that would be the ground substance. Ground substance is a water-based material that's like, like not totally set jello, and there's a lot of compounds that are contained in the ground substance, and it kind of helps to hold everything together. So the next thing I wanna do is talk about ground substance. Ground substance is structureless, and it's kind of like that, un remember I talked about the jello, the unset jello, and the extracellular fibers are embedded in it, as well as some of the other uh, compounds that are needed to keep the structure. The ground substance is going to contain soluble glycoproteins and soluble means water soluble and glycoproteins are proteins that have a, carbo a carbohydrate component. And so these compounds which are uh, referred to as proteoglycans glycoaminoglycans and mucopolysaccharides are suspended in the ground substance and interact with the fibers to keep them held together. Um, and so the, uh, the soluble proteo uh, glycoproteins have a small carbohydrate uh, component. There are also other compounds called proteoglycans Proteoglycans will contain up to 80% carbohydrate, much larger carbohydrate component. And they are, they have a core protein and uh, to which uh, glycoaminoglycan chains are covalently bond. And notice this word covalent, that means that's a strong bond. And the glycoaminoglycans are made up of something I hope that you've heard about, chondroitin is one of the compounds and dermatin sulfates, keratin sulfates, heparin sulfates, and hyaluronic acid. You may hear advertisements for supplements that contain chondroitin for people who are having joint problems. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to increase the amount of chondroitin in the ground substance or in the synovial fluid in the joint. Hyaluronic acid, uh, I pulled that out to talk about it a little bit separately. It's a very viscous substance in joints and we call it synovial fluid. So you can actually see uh, or feel hyaluronic acid. Uh, if you're fabricating a carcass and you cut into the hip joint and there is kind of a yellow substance that comes out, which is the synovial fluid, and it'll be kind of yellow, that's because it has very high and high uronic acid. And high uronic acid's very slippery and it helps it, that joint to move. We also see that chondroitin sulfates uh, are found in cartilage, tendons, and adult bones. Because remember, the connective tissue component is all part of the bone structure, right? 
but we'll also find uh, some other interesting compounds. You're thinking, oh my goodness, she's going to make us know all these. But I just pulled two out that I think are really important, fibronectin and laminin. And fibronectin is found in the ground substance, and it helps mediate the binding of cells to the extracellular matrix, such as collagen fibers and proteoglycans. So these proteoglycans that are in there, that either the soluble uh, glycoproteins or hyaluronic acid, whichever compounds are there, they're pretty slippery. So we need something that's gonna help bind uh, the fibers, the tree branches, right, that are falling, something that binds that to the proteoglycans to give it structure and organization. Uh, laminin, on the other hand, uh, helps to bind the connective tissue to the sarcolemma, the muscle fiber. And actually, laminin kind of st sticks out of uh, of the transmembrane plaque and looks like a little antenna or maybe think about it as a disc, uh, uh, either like a, um, like your, we have dish network and whenever I look at the dish up on top of our house, I think, oh, it looks like laminin. And it's bound as a part of that transmembrane plaque, but laminin interacts uh, with the collagen fibers and the glycoproteins to help bind the, the connected tissue to the muscle fiber. Like endomesium, you know, if endomesium has to be bound in some way to the sarcolemma, otherwise it just kind of, it, it doesn't even need to move with the muscle fiber, it just kind of squishes around in there and the muscle fiber works in between. So we have to have some connection. So fibronectin and laminin are two important components of the ground substance. Ground substance is very important because it helps not only to uh, provide uh, the, the fibroblasts are suspended in the ground substance and there's a lot that goes on there metabolically and that the ground substance helps to cement the fibers and organize the fibers and also helps to bind the connective tissue uh, to the muscle fiber sarcolemma. But the main part of connective tissue, especially in epimesium, paramecium, and endomesium, is the extracellular fibers. And they're referred to as dense connective tissue or loose connective tissue. I don't really want you to remember that, but what I do want you to know is that the three major fibers are collagen, elastin, and reticulum. So let's talk about each one of those. We're gonna talk about collagen first. Do you know that collagen is the most abundant protein in the animal body? So if we took that whole animal and we could uh, digest all of the protein in it and make piles of different proteins, collagen would have the, the biggest pile. And it also has, it makes up about 20, 25% of the total body protein. Pretty amazing. We're very interested in it because it affects tenderness of meat. It affects tenderness of meat through really the paramecium and endomecium because we trim off the epimecium. If it's visible and thick enough for us to see, it's obviously going to have a, a negative effect on tenderness, but usually we trim it off. And we know that connected tissue, the amount of connected tissue is gonna differ in a muscle. And the reason cuts from the chuck and the round aren't worth as much, they have higher amounts of connected tissue. And if you go on the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, UNL, uh, Beef mus uh, Muscle Myology website, and that URL is in your syllabus, you'll find that each muscle has a connective tissue, a collagen content, and it's in milligrams per gram. And that, uh, that each muscle differs. Well, muscles like the tenderloin, not much connective tissue. Kind of a bum muscle, doesn't do a whole lot. Inside and outside round, those have a lot of connective tissue because they work hard. 
So my tendinosis, uh, the the uh, eye around, the same thing. High connected tissue, not worth much, but they help the animal to get around. So we know that muscles differ in connected tissue. Muscles that are of higher value, those that are involved in structural support, are those with less connective tissue. They just don't have as they don't have to work as much. It's a little bit unfair. Those high, those really heavy working muscles, they're worth less, especially to us as meat scientists. So the value of meat on a day-to-day -day basis, when you look at price differentials, differentials between cuts is due to connective tissue. Also, as animals get older, their connective tissue becomes more brittle. We call that less soluble. Another way of saying it is more insoluble to eat. And the reason we have A, B, C, D, and E in our grading standards is because of connective tissue. Meat from older animals is tougher because the connective tissue is not as heat soluble, bottom line. And it's not soluble, so the amount and solubility of the connective tissue have a, have a big influence on tenderness. And meat from cows is worth a lot less than meat from young animals because of connective tissue solubility. The principal components are the principal structure of protein uh, in connective tissue is found in tendons and ligaments, uh, but we are only going to concentrate on those skeletal muscles and how uh, connective tissue and how collagen is, is formed. So one thing that's very interesting about collagen is that one-third of the amino acids in collagen are glycine. What does that mean? It means that if we took all the collagen in the body and we uh, uh, we hydrolyzed it down to only amino acids. 33% of the amino acids out of the 20 amino acids that can be there are glycine. So we see a repeating sequence of glycine, two amino acids, glycine, two amino acids, glycine, two amino acids. And you may not remember this, but glycine is the simplest amino acid. It doesn't have side chains. And uh, so it's, this, it already tells us that if a third of the amino acids are not, uh, don't have acidic or, or basic side chains, it doesn't really bind water. Um, it's pretty innate uh, a type of protein. The other thing that's interesting is about 13 to 14% of the amino acids that are present are going to be proline and hydroxyproline. Hydroxyproline is only found in collagen. It's a derivative amino acid from proline. And when we know that when we have proline in an amino acid sequence, we have a bend. I pointed out that on that paramecium, it looked wavy. Remember I said it's wavy. It has to be wavy because remember, all this connected tissue has to move with the muscle fibers. So proline is part of the reason that we have some bends in the structure. Proline and hydroxyproline are always side by side. So in that amino acid sequence, we're, we're every about 13%, a little more than every 10th one, we're gonna see a glycine, hydroxyproline, proline, then a glycine, two other amino acids, glycine, two other amino acids. And then we're gonna come down here, we're gonna see a, again, a glycine, hydroxyproline, and proline. I'm gonna show you the picture from the textbook to really put this into account. When we put a full uh, protein together, a protein, a single protein of collagen is called tropocollagen. And so that's the structural unit of collagen. We put tropocollagens together and they overlap to form a collagen fiber. Well, I'd like to really use this next slide to help you to understand that. So up here at the top, and this is from your textbook and I gave you the page numbers so that you could go in and look at that. 
and you see that here's glycine. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you the, to do the amino acid structure of glycine right here. Here's proline, again, it's a cyclic amino acid and that cyclic portion of it's what helps to give bends in amino acid structures. And then we have other amino acids. And here it shows that repeating sequence, the glycine, uh, proline, hydroxyproline, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. And these X's represent other amino acids. So if we take this amino acid uh, sequence and we have a single chain molecular helix, so I have, you probably won't be able to see it because of the lighting in here. It, this is a, uh, a um, pipe cleaner that I have, right? So a single chain of this, if I would look at it, and I'm putting the building blocks together to form it, I'm gonna put a glycine here, and then I'm gonna put a proline, hydroxyproline, glycine, and then two other amino acids, a glycine, two other amino acids. And because, you know, right now I have this formed like this, straight line, I'm holding it out, but if I let it go, what's gonna happen is wherever there's a proline, which is a, a proline, hydroxyproline, it's a dot here, it ends up looking like this. So it gives a bend in the sequence, in the long chain. And it's long chain because even though usually long chains have more acetic and basic amino acids, that's not the case here because of all that glycine. And if I just let this relax even more, I go down here and it looks like this. We'll see if I can make this point. See the difference there? It bends here, but then it also bends a second way. That's pretty elastic, isn't it? Look at that. Even my little pipe cleaner, which is more rigid than collagen, you can see that I could stretch it out. So what we do is we take three of these single chain coiled helixes. Oh, I have another one here. I'm gonna put these two together. And when I come back on Monday, I'm bringing all my pipe cleaners and you all have to make some collagen. Oh, well, I only have two, so I have to have a third one. So first I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bend this to be the single chain molecular helix, right? So I have to put all those prolines in there, wherever they're gonna bend. Can you see? I went from straight to this. Now I'm going to bend it even that second time because it, to get it to its native state, okay? Like that. And I'm gonna put the third one in here. Oh, and I just kind of bind it around here and I end up with like a mess, but it's a three chain coiled helix. If we back the magnification back out and look at the whole protein, this is tropocollagen. And when we look at tropocollagen, notice that it has a big head here with a little tail and a smaller head and these little bumps that represent where, the, where you're gonna have bends. To form a collagen fiber, we take a bunch of tropocollagens and so I have tropocollagen here. Oh, I have another one. We're gonna put them tail to tail, if I can do this. And each tropocollagen, you do not need to remember this, but the, again, this is just to help you kind of see what's going on. Each tropocollagen is 280 nanometers. So to make a collagen fiber, first, I put in a, a tropocollagen, another tropocollagen, another tropocollagen. And this little end right here binds to that little end so that we start forming a, a long uh, pole. Then we do that with a second group. Oh, I have more. I know you're amazed. <laughs> Another tropocollagen. And I'm gonna put this in the second fiber. And notice that these, they aren't, they overlap by a quarter. We don't line all the, where we bound 
the collagens together. We don't do it right underneath it. We offset them a quarter because if we put all the break points between tropal collagens at the same line, it would be weaker. This makes it stronger. So that when they say it overlaps by a quarter, that's what they're talking about. So each one of these is a tropal collagen. And when we look at the fiber, we see this serration because of the overlap. So I want you to go through this and make sure that you understand this. And then on Monday morning, I'm bringing all my pipe cleaners and you're all gonna, we're gonna start the day out with you making um, a, some collagen fibers, all right? Well, the other thing that I want you to look at or to understand is how do we get collagen? Collagen's a protein, right? It's a protein. Something has to, it has to go through transcription and all those things that you learn in molecular biology. Well, this is the fibroblast cell. Kind of looks like a fibroblast cell, but there's a lot of stuff on there. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you know everything, but I do want you to know that the fibroblast cell makes a, a protein called pro-collagen, pro-collagen. Now, the difference between pro-collagen and tropocollagen is, look at these little subunits on the end. They're much longer and twisted. It's those subunits that allow the fibroblast. What the fibroblast does is it makes pro-collagen and those tails allow the pro-collagen to get spit out of the cell or transfer across the cell membrane into the extracellular space. Then there is collagenase. Collagenase is an uh, enzyme that breaks the, the units off. And you can see it here. It goes from pro-collagen. Oh, see how the units are broken off? To tropocollagen. The tropocollagen then are put into the matrix to make the fiber, and multiple fibers come together to make paramecium or endomecium. So pretty neat, pretty simple system. And we know endomecium, the fibers are more woven, where paramecium, it looks more like a wall. So I told you that collagen uh, is very important in not only how much collagen is there, but also it plays a role in our B grading system and it relates to maturity. What happens with collagen is collagen actually has to ha link in. Now, in my collagen fiber here, right, I took my three helixes and I bound them around each other because I have pipe cleaners with a wire in the middle. In reality, it's like three wet noodles. So something has to bind them together. Otherwise, they just slip apart. So we have to have cross-linking within the tropocollagen molecule. That's within this, the tropocollagen molecule. And that cross-linking is actually in uh, two phases. The first cross-linking is the soluble cross-linking. The second cross-links are insoluble. So we have intramolecular cross-linking. And go back to the previous slide and insert that in the previous slide as well. Well, if we're gonna, if these are wet noodles, we can bind the tropocollagen together. But once we start putting tropocollagens in line, right? And we have another tropocollagen up here. Something has to hold them together too. That cross-linking is called intermolecular cross-linking. And that's cross-linking between tropocollagen molecules. So if we back up one slide, and let's go back to this picture. Where do we have intra crosslinking and where do we have inter crosslinking? Intra is right here within the tropocollagen molecule across 
these three crosslinks, intramolecular crosslinking. Intermolecular crosslinking occurs down here. It, this tropocollagen and this tropocollagen below it need to have some link. That linkage is intermolecular crosslinking. Now what's interesting about that crosslinking is that when the crosslink is first formed, it's soluble. Then with time, it's sitting around there and it, you know, collagen needs to get tougher and tougher and tougher. It becomes, it goes through, uh, we're gonna call, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but it goes through a keto uh, amine crosslinking and it becomes tougher. Now that second crosslink is why I, to this day, when I was young, I was a cheerleader and I used to do the splits and do all kinds of things and bounce around and do all that. Uh, let's just say I'm not as good at it. And uh, my, my daughter was giving me a hard time and I'm like, sorry, insoluble, uh, inter and intramolecular cross-linking of collagen has decreased my flexibility and I can't move. So think about that a little bit. Uh, as far as collagen. So the cro collagen cross-linking, which is uh, nor normally with hydrogen bonds, we get this two-step uh, two sequence of cross-linking where, and the cross-links, the intra and inter, they're exactly the same cross-links chemically. It's just where they're located. One is located within the tropocollagen molecule and the other one is between the tropocollagen molecule. Well, let's uh, fairly rapidly, I, uh, collagen is a major protein and it's the one that drives the differences. But I wanna talk about elastin and reticulin before I talk a little bit more about those cross links. So elastin is much less abundant than collagen. It's very rubbery. We find it in ligaments. And the back strap, which is the ligament, uh, the cervical ligament or ligamentum nuque, um, and I never could put that into a spec, I just called it back strap, that holds, goes from the head and holds the head up of the animal and runs down through the top of the chuck and uh, through the loin, a rib eye. And we always talk about removing the back strap. And the back strap's very yellow in color. And it is because it is uh, very high in elastin fibers. And elastin fibers are yellow, but they also are really, really tough. And they're very elastic, but they don't break down or tear. And just like collagen, it, uh, elastin has glyce glycine as the major amino acid. But for every eight glycine, we see a, a derivative uh, well, we see desmazine, the amino acid desmazine, and then a derivative of that amino acid called isodesmazine. So every eight glycine, we have this desmazine and isodesmazine. And those amino acids cause elastin to be extremely insoluble. Um, they are 90% nonpolar amino acids, and the desmazine crosslinks are not heat soluble. They are tough. And that's why they're in ligaments. Elastin also happens to be a little bit higher in the semitendinosus muscle than in other muscles. Uh, that's part of the reason the semitendinosus is so tough. And you think about where that hamstring or semitendinosus muscle, it, it needs that, that uh, elasticity and that strength. So elastin non-soluble, non-heat labile, same, mean the same thing. Reticulin is the third fiber. It, we don't find reticulin very prevalent in epimesium and paramecium, uh, but it can be there. It's composed of very small fibers and they form this delicate network around cells, blood vessels, neural structures, and epithelium. So we'll find some with the neural structures and with the blood system that's in meat. 
but we mainly see reticulin during embryonic development and it's the first to appear uh, in differentiation to provide support. So we won't really talk about reticulin now after this. All right, next to the last slide. Why do you need to know all this about connective tissue? As you know, and as I've already said, it's because it's related to tenderness. It's related to value. If we could get old animals to have more soluble connective tissue, their tenderness would improve significantly. And uh, Dr. Cross, our former department head, actually did his dissertation work here at Texas A&M. And he showed that when you look at animals, uh, especially young versus old, uh, the percent soluble collagen, or how soluble their collagen was, was found to be related to tenderness. Because collagen will break down with heat, and as the animals get older, there's less and less soluble collagen. <clears throat> Paramecium is about 20% of the paramecium collagen, soluble collagen in young animals. In old animals, it gets down to like 5% and even less. So it's a pretty big change. So if you measure soluble collagen, then or how soluble the collagen is, you get a very good indication of tenderness. Now within young animals, as long as you're not talking about different cuts, but if you're talking about the ribeye or the uh, strip loin or uh, those major cuts, collagen solubility yeah, it can vary a little bit, but it doesn't really drive tenderness differences between young animals. It drives tenderness differences between their round and chuck cuts and their loin cuts but that's a collagen amount. Old animals, we see that increase in insoluble cross links, which don't break down with heat, and that's what makes meat from older animals tougher. So that is collagen solubility that really drives the value difference between young versus old animals. Elastin doesn't break down at all with heat, and neither does uh, reticulin. So collagen is the one that we have a chance to influence. So in summary, I've talked about ground substance. You need to know a couple of the uh, compounds involved with it and how it's put together. We talked about collagen structure and if you can explain the uh, two slide or the slide that had the two pictures, one the collagen structure, the other one with the fibroblast, then, then you have all the information that I would ask you questions about. But I do want you know, to know about collagen solubility and tenderness because we're going to talk about that in more detail here in a couple weeks and then know a little bit about elastin and reticulin as we discuss them. I hope that uh, this information is clear. As you know, it's really hard for me to not ha be in the classroom with you and to see if you're going, oh, what is she talking about? And hopefully this will give you a good basis. What I'd like to do Monday morning when you come to class is we'll do a slight review of this, make sure that you have a good understanding of collagen and I will bring my pipe cleaners and we can play. I really appreciate your time and your attention and uh, let's hope we beat the hell out of Arkansas this weekend. Thank you very much and all stay safe. Goodbye.